Well, good evening and welcome to this latest Wild Live from the Wildlife Trust. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. We're delighted that so many of you have been keen to join for this really important discussion this evening. Uh, we started the Wild Lives back in uh, the summer and we've done all kinds of issues. We've looked at the marine environment, we've looked at the link between health and well-being and nature and a whole load of issues. And many of them have been exploring all the kind of fun elements of nature and getting into nature and so on. This month, we thought it was really important to look at a big issue that has come up over the last month or so, and that, of course, is the badger cull. But actually, we didn't want to just have a big argy-bargy about pro-cull or anti-cull and just that. We wanted to really explore the science around this, the science around TB and actually around vaccination as well. And we've got a fantastic panel of people to join us tonight for that discussion. We have uh, Rosie Woodruff, who's a senior ecologist with the Zoological Society of London, and has really been pioneering work around uh, the science around vaccinations. And you'll hear some fantastic stuff from Rosie tonight on that. We have two representatives from the Wildlife Trusts. We have uh, Cheryl Marriott, who's head of conservation at the Cornwall Wildlife Trust, who's been particularly working with farmers around the vaccination programme. And we have Joe Smith, who's chief executive of the Derbyshire Wildlife Trust and who's our lead on badgers nationally for uh, the Wildlife Trusts as a whole. And then we have Chris Packham, who needs very little introduction, I'm sure, uh, known to so many as uh, one of Britain's leading naturalists and of course, television presenters on this area. And with very strong views of how badgers has made it very clear. And of course, working through wild justice to try and challenge uh, the badger cull. And then we have Dominic Dyer, Chief Executive of the Badger Trust. So a fantastic panel to explore this tonight. Now, it's also worth saying, we did try and have a farmer join the panel tonight. We spoke to many farmers about this and uh, we did actually have a farmer lined up to join us. But unfortunately, just in the last, uh, just today actually, uh, the farmer that we had lined up to join uh, to discuss tonight uh, decided that they would pull out and the reason for that they said is I mean they were they're not pro coal they're pro vaccination and they felt that they were worried about sticking their head above the parapet uh, on this issue and being pro vaccination so that kind of that's a real concern I think for us uh, because we didn't want to just get into a straight pro anti uh, coal we wanted to explore lots of other issues around it and it's a shame I think that we've ended up not having a farmer joining the panel but Although the Wildlife Trust's view on badger cull is very clear, we are strongly opposed to the badger cull with pro-vaccination, and you'll hear lots of explanations tonight as to why that is. Nonetheless, what we want to do tonight is have a good discussion and to put a lot of questions, as many questions as we can, from you, the audience, to the panellists. And my job tonight is not so much to represent the Wildlife Trust, if you like, but to chair this and make sure I'm putting those questions to the panel members. And we have people on the panel, two people representing the Wildlife Trusts anyway. So I will be making sure I put a fair range of the questions and comments that you raise live as we go through this discussion, we put them to our fantastic panel. So rest assured of that. And we're gonna have a very interesting evening, I think. We know this is an issue where passions run high and it's totally understandable why that's the case, but it's very important that we explore beyond the headlines and actually explore into the solutions beyond just culling as well. Because when that's held up as the only solution, we think it's time to really explore the alternative solutions instead. So let's get straight into it. And we think who best to really start this discussion than Rosie Woodruff, who's, uh, as I said, senior ecologist at the Zoological Society of London and been doing some fantastic work around this over many years. So Rosie's gonna introduce the science behind bovine, bovine TB to us and transmission and the impact of a cull on badger behavior. Rosie, thanks so much for taking the time to join us this evening. Over to you. Thanks a lot, Craig. I was hoping we were gonna hear first from a farmer affected by TB because that's why we're all here. A TB just wouldn't be an issue if it wasn't a huge problem for farmers, not just for its financial impacts, but also for the mental stress it causes. Since there isn't a farmer here, and I, you know, I'm not a farmer, I'm a scientist, and I can only understand how this feels for farmers that are poor secondhand. But when I think of it, having spoken to a lot of farmers, in things that I would understand, it seems to me as though having a TB test in your herd is a bit like I would look at having to have a, a smear test or a mammogram, some 
test for cancer that's horrible, the test itself is horrible, then you have to wait for the result. And the result, depending on what, what the outcome is, might turn your life completely upside down. And I'd really like us to keep that in mind as we discuss this issue, that whilst for the wildlife sector, this is all about animals, uh, wild, you know, wild animals. For farmers, this is a source of enormous stress, even for the farmers whose herds end up testing negative. And of course, for those who test positive, it's a massive economic problem as well. Um, so keep that in mind as we, as, we, as we go forward. And if this is a farmer's problem, should the wildlife sector be involved at all? And I think um, they should, and here's why. Uh, the best estimates suggest that the vast majority of herds which get TB at somewhere between 75 and 99 percent of herds which get GB are infected by other cattle herds. So there's definitely a huge amount of work to do to control cattle to cattle transmission. But really importantly, that figure isn't 100 percent. Not all cattle herds get TB from other cattle. And there's no doubt from the scientific evidence that badgers can and do transmit TB to cattle. And that means that TB eradication, which after all is the policy aim, can only be achieved if TB is also eradicated from badgers. Um, and that, and once you've decided that, it doesn't, we don't need to argue about is it 1% of herds or 20% of herds or 50% of herds. We need to do something about badgers if we're going to eradicate the disease from cattle. So let's think how we might do that. Now, right now, as we all know, the main form of management is culling. We've, we're seeing hundreds of thousands of native mammals killed, not always humanely, across an area from the far south of Cornwall, close to where I am, all the way up to the Peak District. Um, it's going on right now. In fact, sun's just set here in Cornwall. Um, by the end of our 90 minute session, about 150 badgers are likely to have died while we're here talking about it. So as a society, I think we have to ask, is it worth it? Will mass killing of badgers achieve what we want? And what we want, remember, is for farmers to stop losing, losing sleep because bovine TB is a thing of the past. That's what we want. We would like to also have, uh, of course, um, functioning ecosystems as well. Well, the evidence suggests that badger culling won't achieve that. So done properly, killing badgers might reduce cattle TB temporarily, but it will never eradicate it. And let me explain why. And to do that, I want to diverge for a moment to talk about another disease that we all know rather too well at the moment. So we're all currently battling with COVID. That's why we're not all in the same room at the, at the moment. And if we've learned, learned one thing from the last few months, it's that human behaviour can affect disease transmission. Back in the spring, COVID was spreading exponentially in the UK. Then there was a lockdown and the COVID cases dropped. Lockdown was relaxed, the spread started again, and now we're seeing lockdowns happen again. All these changes have been nothing to do with how many people there are in the population. All that's changed is changing human behavior, and that's what affects the disease spread. And it's the same with badgers. So badgers naturally live in what we would now, among people, call bubbles. Left undisturbed, they'll mostly mix with other members of their family group. And by, by not having that mixing, that's going to limit the spread of TB from group to group and so across from farm to farm. But culling changes all that. When a badger population is changed, the survivors, sorry, when the badger population is culled, the survivors move around a lot more and they're potentially going to meet other badgers. The number of badgers may be lower, but the proportion with TB after culling is higher. So going back to COVID, imagine trying to control COVID by getting rid of 70% of people, but sending all the remaining 30% out on a pub crawl every night. You might have fewer COVID cases because there's fewer people, but you're certainly not going to eradicate the disease. Now for TB, that's the sort of thing that we're doing as a, with a culling-based eradication strategy, and that's why it's not going to work. Let's contrast that with vaccination, which I think the evidence suggests is much more likely to help eradicate the disease. Firstly, by not culling, you preserve those bubbles, those badger social groups that naturally limit TB spread. Um, and then you give them a big boost by making sure that many of the badgers in the population don't become infectious. You can also protect badgers from becoming infected by cattle. And over time, what should happen is the infected badgers should die off, the prevalence should fall, and the risk to cattle should fall with it. What's the problem? The problem is that hardly anyone in the farming industry knows or believes just how promising badger vaccination is. They spent decades being told that only a badger cull can bring an end to the nightmare of TB. And of course, they're suspicious because many of the people promoting vaccination are doing it so because they care about badgers, not because they're there to care about farmers. So how do we solve this problem? Well, we're not gonna solve it tonight. We're not gonna solve it with this panel because we're all wildlife people. We have no voice here from the farming sector. We've heard why. That has to change. Now the government's policy is moving towards vaccination. 
And ultimately, the reason it's not happening is for the re same reason that that farmer isn't here today. It's because um, farmers are not, as a, as a community, are mostly not behind it. So I think we in the wildlife sector at the moment need to be really, really careful at this point. If you think at the, about the other big wildlife issues that we face at the moment, things like, think of raptor persecution, think of fox hunting. These are problems because the people who are affected by the policy don't believe in it and so they ignore it. And then it's really difficult to enforce the law in a remote area on private land, especially at sort of 4 a.m. when you might be out vaccinating badgers. I mean, we mustn't let the badger issue get to this point. If we force the badger vaccination onto an unwilling farming community that stays fiercely supportive of culling, the vaccination just isn't going to happen. So it's not going to work. And if it doesn't work, farmers are going to be calling for a return to culling. So I think that at this point, what we have to do is look at everything we do, every direction we take with this and ask whether our actions are going to help to solve the problem or whether they're just going to further polarise the issue. Because if the issue gets polarised any more than it is already, we're not going to solve the problem for farmers or for badgers. Rosie, thank you very much for that. Now, you said something interesting there, which uh, highlights uh, is relevant to a question that we've had from Joe Richards. Uh, you said that the government policy you think is moving towards vaccination. But I mean, that's, that's very confusing, isn't it, to most people that aren't close to this because we just had the government say they're going to massively expand culling. Can we just tease that out a little bit more? What, what, what is it you mean there? And how? So, what, so the government's what, policy. About? Yeah, bear in mind, I, I don't make policy. I don't advise yeah. on policy. I have no no role in government. Um, but as I understand that the government's policy is to transition gradually from culling to vaccination. Now, how they propose doing that um, is mostly when areas that have been culled, which is now a vast area of Western part of the country, when those areas have been culled to vaccinate them after they've had four years of culling. Um, now, I can sort of go off on a bit of a tangent there and tell you why I think that that's not the approach that I would have recommended, because um, uh, because we know, as I mentioned, we know that culling increases the proportion of badges with TB. And we also know that vaccination works on the ones which haven't got TB. So by culling, you make the badges more trap shy, you make them more difficult to vaccinate and you, meet, you, make, you reach a point where fewer of them are, are sort of usefully vaccin vaccinatable. Um, so, but nevertheless, you know, there's a vast areas of the country which have been culled, certainly transitioning to uh, vaccination will be, um, on, in those areas, will be, you know, the vaccination will start to work more slowly than it would if you hadn't done all the culling previously. Um, but, that, but, but just to sort of, you know, come back to your point, yes, the idea is to, um, is to gradually transition from a, a culling policy to a vaccination policy slowly over a number of years. Um, I think that DEFRA recognised that they've got a really long way to go to convince farmers that this is the direction they should be taking. Um, and one of my frustrations is that as far as I can tell, they haven't even started yet. So they issued that policy in March. Um, they then issued a whole load of follow up cull licences into places where where they could have said, right, we're going to we're going to practice what we preach and we're going to start putting in place at least some pilots of uh, vaccination post culling. But everywhere that that reached the end of its four-year car license uh, last year was renewed for supplementary culling this year. Um, and so to be far, clear, Rosie, the government's position, as you understand it, is to move to vaccination after they've killed a load of, load of badgers. Yeah, mostly, except for a few areas where farmers have not either wanted to have wanted to cull. So here in West Cornwall, Touchwood, we haven't had a cull. There's quite a lot of opposition to culling locally, and this is uh, one of the areas where we're vaccinating. Uh, and where so far there hasn't been a cull. Um, East Sussex is another another such area. Uh, and a quick question from Tim Eldred. Uh, what evidence is there of local extinctions of badgers as a result of culling? Well, there's certainly a big impact. Um, part of the difficulty is we don't know, they don't know when they start these culls how many badgers there are. They're kind of counting the badgers through the end of the gut. Um, but there are certainly areas where the minimum number to be killed this year um, has is zero, so they're clearly concerned at, that that they that if they kill any more badgers, they will risk causing extinction. I would imagine that it depends how small a scale you you, you go to. So it, they'll they'll certainly be small areas where there's large you know there's empty sets that, um, but there's no there's none of them are causing extinction on a massive scale. But it's certainly going to be enough to cause major ecological change. Remember, the badger is our biggest native predator, our biggest native carnivore, and when you when you 
kill most of them, that has impact that will lead to increases in fox numbers, um, changes in hedgehog numbers, um, a variety of other ecological changes that we haven't even had to, an opportunity to study. Okay, well, Rosie, thank you very much for kicking us off tonight with that, that introduction. And it, and it is really good to have you uh, tonight joining us and, and giving us the science behind this. Uh, so we've heard there a lot about vaccination and we thought it'd be really interesting for you to hear a little bit more about what's involved in vaccination programs. And so uh, let's go to Cheryl Marriott with the Cornwall Wildlife Trust, who've been doing a huge amount of work of working with farmers around vaccination. Cheryl, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks, Craig. Good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, so the reason I'm on the panel is because at, at Cornwall Wildlife Trust, we completely changed the way we communicate about badger culling. We did that four years ago. Um, at the time, there was culling just in North Cornwall. It's since expanded. We'd just been invited onto the Cornwall TB eradication group at that time. So I started to fill my head with facts and figures. Um, ready to fight my corner. Luckily, before I went to that meeting, I read some social science research on BTB. So this is human to human communication that this is all about. And I read that research and literally had a light bulb moment. Um, the research highlighted three things that made us rethink how we do things in Cornwall. One was about how polarized the views are and, and the researchers questioned lots of people and they found that the views on the colour are so polarised that changing people's minds is almost impossible. And it doesn't matter what evidence you put in front of them. So I would just encourage all of the audience there who will have strong views one way or the other probably to think what would it take for you to change your mind on this issue. And I can imagine a lot of you are shouting at your screen saying nothing. And that's going to make you wonder why we keep trying to change each other's mind. Second thing was that when you continually tell somebody that what, you, what they're doing is wrong, then you're quickly going to get to the point where they don't want to talk to you at all. It, it's like children in the playground going la, 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 like that. They just don't want to know. The third thing is that that arguing then kills off any chance of working collaboratively and innovatively on the very problem that we're all trying to fix. I think of, the, of arguing about the colours like a black hole with its own gravity trying to pull you in. And that's exactly what I was almost fell into before I went to that first meeting. Anyway, so how did this change things for Cornwall Trust? Well, we we took a step back and thought, what are we, what change do we want to see in Cornwall? And ultimately it would be that farmers and landowners learn more about vaccination so they could then have a choice. They know they've got a choice. And of course we'd like them to choose vaccination over culling. We thought the best way of doing that for us in our position as a local wildlife trust is to raise awareness of vaccination. And really importantly, the potential benefits to cattle we're not just talking about badges all the time. So with support from our trustees, we made a bit of a policy change at the trust and we decided to stop talking about being anti-coal. And we would just, instead, we would just talk about vaccination. It's quite a straightforward change, but I think it's had quite a profound impact on how we do things. So leading on from that, in 2018, we started vaccinating with Zoological Society London and Ro Rose's team with their help. We started vaccinating on some of our own nature reserves because we thought we've got to practice what, what we preach. We publicised this and then that led to us being approached by a group of farmers from Mid Cornwall who wanted to know more. Now, a few of that group weren't able to cull because of their landlord. And that was important because that's what catalyzed the meeting. What it, what it started. So I went to meet 30 of them, um, but I made it really clear with that social science in my head, I made it really clear that I wasn't there to dissuade them from joining the cull. Um, and the cull was recruiting at the same time. So this was quite a tense time in Cornwall. I told them what I knew about vaccination, but we also talked about the evidence gaps as well. This wasn't me um, spinning the information, trying to persuade them. It was all 
you know, very transparent. They were brilliant. They were open-minded. They were challenging. They asked good questions, but we didn't slip into the arguing. And by my huge surprise, by the end of the evening, half of them signed up wanting to vaccinate. I didn't, that's not what we expected when we went there. This was to give them some information. But as we left, we had a new vaccination project to organise. We've now done two seasons of vaccination on, on those farms with ZSL. The farmers pay in to help cover the costs because we've got no funding down here because we're a high risk area. There's no vaccination funding. The farmers help with the pre-baiting to save us driving up and down all the time and, and um, spending all that extra time. Farmers have told me they like being part of something that's got the public support. They like the fact that Rosie and her team are including the area in their research, so we're helping to fill those evidence gaps. And just to give you an insight of how different this is to the stories we hear of culling, after that first season, we met on one of the farms to talk it all through, how things had gone. We had a barbecue, we shared a glass of farm cider, and we got a round of applause from the farmers for all our efforts and all those early mornings. Not that it was me doing most of that, but all our efforts, they gave us a clap. Now, it is a small area and it is surrounded by culling, but it demonstrates to me how things could be if we can go into this with the right attitude. Um, so I'm gonna keep shouting about that project and those mid Cornwall farmers from the rooftops. Well, Cheryl, thank you, thank you very much for that. And uh, I think what we've sorted out for you, just to sort of give a bit more illustration to the project that Cheryl's been involved in, we've got a clip from ITV News uh, that shows it. Next tonight, trying to prevent the spread of bovine TB has often proved controversial, with many landowners and farmers against the practice of culling badgers. Now, Cornwall Wildlife Trust is tackling the issue with a group of farmers in mid-Cornwall, and since May have vaccinated 61 against the disease, as Grace Pascoe has been finding out. Keith Truscott's cattle graze land around Cornwall's clay country. His herd are now TB-free. But this time last year, that wasn't the case, after one reacted positively to a bovine TB skin test. It's a misery because every 60 days you've got to bring them in and test them. Um, it is so disruptive. Um, you can keep on animals when you should have sold them. It's a drain all the way around, mentally and physically. It's tough going. TB is not a, a pleasant experience. Outbreaks of the disease do seem to be on the rise. It's really the most serious endemic livestock disease in the country. Um, things like foot and mouth are more frightening because they kind of come ripping through and cause, you know, chaos. But um, TB is just there. It's, it's really not under control. It's, it's got worse over recent decades. Keith and a group of over 20 farmers in mid Cornwall are now working together with Cornwall Wildlife Trust and the Zoological Society of London to vaccinate badgers against TB. Badger vaccination has a, has a valuable role to play in TB eradication. It's never going to eradicate the disease from cattle on its own because the best estimate is that 94% of cattle herds that get TB get it from other cattle herds. So badgers are just a small proportion of the problem. Vaccination of badgers can help reduce the proportion of badgers with TB. We're hoping that the evidence that we gather will show that this is a win-win for farmers and wildlife. Since May, the team have vaccinated 61 badgers around the St Stephen's area. Well, we knew that we wanted to vaccinate badgers on our own reserves, and that's what we were setting out to do. But at the same time, the farmers here found out about vaccination and, and then wanted our help. So we have, have stepped up to do that for them. Um, so it, it wasn't actually something we set out to do, um, but I'm really glad we have. And um, it's been going really well. Many farmers, including Keith, aren't comfortable with culling badgers. Culling, I suppose, is going to have to have its place. I think it's a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Do we really have the right to shoot all these badgers when they're still jury out on how much they pass it? All we want is the same as the cull people. All we're aiming for is 
cattle free from TB. In the beginning of all this, we didn't really know there was an option until, until we spoke to the Wildlife Trust. I think we're pleased by the results so far. Over the next four years, Cornwall Wildlife Trust are hoping to prove badger vaccination is a viable alternative to culling. And in the meantime, they want to hear from farmers and landowners in the county if they're interested in the vaccination project. Grace Pascoe, ITV News, High Street, near St Austell. I think that clip gives us a much greater insight of what it looks like on the ground. So Cheryl, a question for you. We've had a question in from many people as this as we started Wild Live tonight. How can we address that stigma issue that you know those farmers that are actually anti coal but pro vaccination feel it, feel they can't speak out and say that at the moment? In fact, the fact that we had a problem that a farmer that was going to join the panel tonight with that view and they felt they had to pull out last minute. I think. It just shows we need to raise the level of understanding generally among the farmers. I think farming groups have a responsibility here um, because farmers do have a choice, but I think they're only hearing one side of it. So I, I would like to ask that question to, to some of our, our farming groups like the NFU. Um, and we need to find individuals like Keith, who you saw on the film there, who, who are are really pleased to be part of something like that and, and they, they will speak out. So we've got to, we've got to find those individuals that um, aren't afraid to stick their head up. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. And uh, Rosie, just back to you quickly before I go to Chris. We've Again, we've had a quick, many questions coming in, one from Ken Golding, but lots of questions saying, please explain the problem with vaccinating cattle. I think that's a good one for you, Rosie. Sure. And you're, it's absolutely right that a, a cattle vaccine would be the holy grail. We only care about about dealing with TB in badgers because we're trying to protect cattle. And if cattle were all protected by vaccination, then, you know, we, we uh, well, who knows what might, you know, what, what, what we might be able to achieve and how quickly. Um, th so there is a vaccine. The vaccine that badgers have, that cattle have, is the same that I had when I was a teenager and many of, many of the audience will have had as bovine, uh, uh, would be a BCG, which is actually a form of bovine TB, a modified form of bovine TB. Um, that vaccine has been there for a really long time. The difficulty is that um, it, that cu currently, with the with the current tests which are available, uh, a cow which is immune to TB because she's been vaccinated will test positive on the current tests. So the difficulty is to distinguish an infected from a vaccinated animal because I might know I vaccinated up all my cattle. I might believe that they're all protected from TB, but when I want to sell one which tests positive to Joe, um, then Joe's going to ask me quite rightly, well, you know, how can I believe you that you're selling me a cow that's vaccinated, not one that's got TB? Um, and so the challenge has been to develop a test which can distinguish an infected from a vaccinated animal. Now, the lab people believe they have such a test and the government has um, just recently announced a trial uh, of cattle vaccination. So, you know, that's that's a, a field where we're optimistic that... that um, a lot, of, a lot of efforts going into that, and that's something which we might have in the future. Great. Thank you, Rosie. I know a lot of people were questioning that, so it's good to have heard that explained. Uh, so over to Chris Packham. Chris, you have been really at the forefront of trying to challenge the column, and particularly through your work through Wild Justice. You had a petition going on it. You've spoken out very firmly about it. Uh, talk to us about what you're doing to try and challenge the column, just the, the public support you're getting uh, on, on doing that. Well, thank you, Craig, and, and thank you to the panelists for, for allowing me to join this evening and to all of those uh, viewers watching. Um, before I get started on that, the first thing I'd like to say I find incredibly heartening is the way that we started this evening, two speakers that we've already heard. Rosie beginning uh, by asking for empathy and sympathy towards our, our farmers. I think that's incredibly important because amongst all the ills the badger Carl has thrown up is its divisiveness. It, it's, it's split many conservationists away from farming and farmers away from conservation and this has had devastating impacts not just in regard to the cull uh, which Cheryl has spoken about but across the need to manage our landscape in a more sustainable and, and healthy way for wildlife and for people too. So working with those farmers and showing our keen support for them and understanding their needs and requirements has always been at the forefront of, of what we conservationists have, have wanted to do. Unfortunately, as Cheryl identified and has very properly and superbly managed, is 
addressing the fact that the issue has become polarized. And I would say that some of those farming groups, as some of the hardcore conservationists, have been responsible for, for that polarization. And it's been crippling in our ability to communicate effectively and, and make meaningful progress. So anything that we can do to, 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 to stop that, I think, is, is, is really important. Myself, well, you know, I feel to a great extent that I've been a, a victim of that. Um, I take an enormous amount of, of grief and flack from bodies such as the NFU. They try to portray me as anti farming generally, let alone just the badger cull, um, which is an enormous burden and, and, and a gross mistruth. I've spent the last you know, 15, 20 years of my life asking people to support UK farmers, to understand the problems that they face, to make sure that they put pennies directly in their pocket whenever they can. Um, because what right have we as conservationists got to go banging on the farm door, asking them to manage their uh, livelihoods, to manage their economics, to manage our, the, the landscape in a different way if we're not actually proactively showing them support ourselves. And that's me and you, that's all of us viewers, you know, the people that rush down to the supermarket to buy cheap food that's imported from overseas. And I'm not being nationalist uh, at all about it here um, uh, in any way, shape or form. I, I'm just saying that our farming fraternity in, in many ways is in deep trouble and it will be in deeper trouble after Brexit. And if we collectively don't rally around and support them, then we will never be able to work cooperatively with them in a creative way to, to move forward. So this is a time for building bridges, you know, and I would love to be able to meet and rationalize with bodies such as the NFU that in the past have taken such a hard line to, to create these sorts of divisions, build around fear. That's why we create these divisions. Whether we're conservationists or farmers, it's based upon on fear, but we have to strip that away and, and, and move forward. So at the same time, people like myself like reading what Rosie researches. You know, I, I'm keen to hear the science. I want to make evidence-based decisions. I expect the politicians that I elect to make evidence-based decisions. And when they fail to do so, then we get frustrated. And Dominic and I, you know, keen campaigners, uh, are the first to voice our frustration. When we have clear answers through clear, independent, peer-reviewed uh, science, the type of which Rosie has been publishing for years, then we expect our politicians to make their decisions based upon that. And when they fail to do so, then it's our job to challenge it. We're fortunate to live in a democracy, which brings us to wild justice. And wild justice is a, a triad of people, myself, Mark Avery and Ruth Tingay, that have come together to explore a different method of affecting uh, conservation in parallel with what the NGOs, the Wildlife Trust, RSPB, Butterfly Conservation, so on and so forth are doing uh, with their own um, methods. And we found that there was an opportunity to make some legal challenges, to get people thinking, not necessarily to win those legal challenges, but to use them as a means of getting people thinking. You know, and sometimes it's not about standing on the outside of the court steps with a big smile on your face. It's actually about having made people think, maybe made people change their minds. And of course, in order to get to court, we need that good evidence. And whether it's wrapped to persecution, where we have plenty of evidence that crimes are taking place, or whether the current petition that you've mentioned, Craig, that is running, is about the inhumane nature of the cull, the number of animals that are surviving for periods of longer than five minutes after they've been shot, the number of animals that are suffering beyond the guidelines that the government says that it should be following. And we have evidence to suggest that that, that number is not acceptable, and therefore we want to raise that issue so it's there for discussion and we feel that we have evidence there to to raise it as a as a a point of, of legal discussion too and i would like to you know campaign at this point it's my job um, and say please go to that e-petition site wild justice and please sign up we've got nearly fifty thousand people that have signed within a week and again this shows the gravity of concern that we have for the extent of the cull and in this instance the inhumane nature of it um, will we make any progress well i think we are making progress the very fact that we have a panel this evening speaking rationally about this trying to find methods of working cooperatively with the farming fraternity listening to science reaching out to people to ask them to moderate their views and um, to to take a far less extreme stance on this and a far more creative and proactive one it is definitely progress and i think if you think back to 2013 when this particular um, cull started, um, we've been enmeshed in all sorts of arguments and we conservationists, frankly, if, it were, if we were counting the number of badgers killed, 
then we have very definitely lost. More than 100,000 animals have been killed so far. So if our mission was to keep badgers alive, we failed. And that's why people like Shell trying new techniques, we have to listen to them. We have to, you know, you know, take a take a line from people like that because you know I've tried and failed. Dominic has been working really hard. I'm not saying we haven't had successes, but 100,000 badgers have died, and they are on the emblem behind you, Craig, and they are on the badge of all of our wildlife trust. They're one of the most popular animals in the UK. You know, we hold them very close to our heart, and as Rosie has pointed out, they are a key part of the ecology of our country, and widespread culling in the long term will damage the ecology of that country uh, of our country we, we know that and as a consequence we need to stop losing and we need to start winning and to do that we need to win a few more hearts and minds there's no doubt about that chris thank you very much let me ask you a question is there anything i mean you've campaigned on so many issues over the years is there anything about what about this issue has particularly stood out for you as, as kind of different or unique well, I think along with the raptor persecution thing, it is the fact that it's become so polarised. Um, I think it's very different than raptor persecution. Um, raptor persecution is, is, is wholly illegal. And it, there's a relatively small number of people um, who, who are doing it. And it's relatively focused within the driven grouse shooting fraternity. So we have a much clearer target there. And we have the law on our side. There's no ambiguity about it. It's much easier to argue against raptor persecution it's frankly plainly illegal and we've had increasing evidence to suggest that it's limiting the spread and the population of some of our raptor species hen harrier golden eagle etc and it's garnering you know very rapidly growing public support and i think that we'll see better regulation certainly within that branch of the shooting fraternity relatively soon so if you like you know, we could say that we're, we're, we're winning that one, as opposed to the Badger Coal, where we've made a lot less progress over a longer period of time with intense campaigning. But of course, it's always tough. You know, whatever campaign we're in, it, you know, we would all like to be working, you know, creatively, cooperatively, um, you know, trying to find, you know, acceptable compromises in our beliefs and practices with whoever views, you know, we oppose. Um, and so within the cull, as we've heard so pertinently from Rosie and Cheryl, I, I think that we do have to start talking. We have to start talking with people. We need more of those farmers to be able to have the ability to put their head above the parapet and not fear reprisals from their peers um, and say that they would like to embrace vaccination rather than move straight to culling. At the same time, I think we have to keep pressure on our politicians. You know, that potential cattle vaccine is the holy grail and we should be asking them to make serious investment in it and and to progress it as quickly as possible and the associated testing because that would pretty much you know be the silver bullet if you forgive the ugly pun um, in in this issue so i think we still have to campaign on, on on a number of fronts and some quite forcefully certainly when it comes to our politicians uh, you know whether we you know in, seek to reduce the polarization in the debate with farmers we should still be quite forthright with our politicians to make sure that they act on best evidence the sort of evidence that our scientists are supplying and whether that's badger culling or, or the climate or raptor persecution and everything else their job is to listen to scientists and implement their um, recommendations and when they fail to do so i think we as citizens whether it's badger culling or anything else in our lives have the right the democratic right to to stand up and complain about it so long as we do so in a peaceful way great chris thank you very much well to, just to give you a flavor about the range of comments we're getting in tonight one from Mike challenging what we're saying, saying the goal is not eradication, it's to reduce badger density. And one from Andrew saying, I led Natural England's work on bovine TV and badgers for five years. All the decisions were political, the science was disregarded. Uh, also, lots of comments coming in, Cheryl saying, well done, and what a brilliant project you've got down at the Cornwall Wildlife Trust. Uh, one from Pat saying, so nice to see a more common sense approach and getting people to work together. So thank you so much. Keep those comments coming in and questions coming in. We will try and get through as many of them as possible tonight. So now to Dominic Dyer, Chief Executive of the Badger uh, Trust. And uh, Dominic, you've been campaigning on these issues for a long time. Talk to us about that, the campaigning side. Yes, 
you know, I'll start because it's often when I speak about badger culling, people look at me and go, oh, it's Dominic again. He's ranting about badgers, not listening to the farmers. He's not showing any understanding of the agriculture industry. You know, I spent 13 years of my career in the civil service in the Ministry of Agriculture and then went on to work in the food industry for eight years, traveling around the world, looking at farms and agriculture systems in most continents. And then went on to head up the plant science industry in Britain and Europe through their trade body for, for another five years. So, you know, I've worked very closely with government ministers in the agriculture farming sector, both from within government and industry, and work very closely at senior levels with the NFU and, and the, you know, other aspects of the food chain and the farming sector. So I didn't come into the badger cull issue from a point of view of just wanting to be hostile to farmers, but if I wanted to explain how I feel about this policy after nine years of campaigning on it, I, I could, I'd probably give you an example. I think it's like a big onion. I'll start with that in your mind. And, Basically, you have to peel off the layers of the onion and each layer you get more incompetence, more negligence and more deceit. And it makes you cry with despair and anger. And, you know, I've come to the conclusion that this is something that's very fundamentally wrong at the heart of our political system. This is not so much about farmers. I see farmers as a victim of what we're doing to the badger because they're not really getting a solution to the problem of bovine TB. You know, Rosie, another very qualified scientist, did an amazing job with a randomized badger culling trial. If we went back to the late 90s, early noughties, when the Labour Party was last in office, um, you know, really what the Labour government at the time wanted to do was to get an answer to this question. Is killing badgers, significant numbers of badgers, going to make a meaningful, large contribution to lowering bovine TB in cattle? And to find that, you know, answer, you know, 50 million pounds of taxpayers' money was spent, nearly 11,000 badgers were killed, you know, significant amount of peer-reviewed research, probably the most significant, I would say, anywhere undertaken in the world. And when John Bourne and the Independent Scientific Group and Rosie and others involved in that came up with their conclusions, you know, it was important that they stated that, that they believed that badger culling in the way that it's being undertaken at the moment will make no meaningful contribution to lowering bovine TB in cattle. And that actually the focus should really be on cattle-based measures. Yet it was a political intervention in my view, and it's interesting we've just had that comment come from, from someone who's worked in Natural England that sort of changed the pace of this whole process. So David King, the chief scientist at the time intervened. Rosie's familiar with this. I think he spent about two weeks with a panel he set up fair to enough. look at all of this. Well, fair enough. And it's interesting at the moment, isn't it? So David is, is a key critic of the government's policy on COVID with his own independent SAGE committee, where he's saying they're playing fast and loose politics with science. But you could make the accusation at his door that when it came to bovine TB, he could be guilty of doing the same because it might be that he was speaking to the Prime Minister, Tony Blair. I've no doubt there was contact there and with the NFU and the opposition, David Cameron, but for some reason, clearly he felt he needed to intervene. And I know he did so at the EFRA Select Committee, I believe, that where John Bourne was producing evidence before MPs in a very public way to say that he felt that actually the findings of the ISG to a degree were flawed. And if you change various parameters and change various aspects of what you were doing with badger calling, it could actually work. And I think that was a key moment in all of this because it clearly gave David Cameron as opposition leader an opportunity to pick it up, the NFU to say, despite what the ISG has come up with, we believe culling still has a role to play. So in it went into the Conservative Manifesto in 2010. And the rest is really history. You know, the coalition was formed, badger culling was, you know, back on. And since, since 2013, we have seen 60 million pounds of taxpayers' money spent, 103,000 badgers killed to date, probably another 65,000 to be killed this year. That'll take the cost up to about 70 million pounds. And throughout this process, we've seen decision after decision made, which I think has had huge consequences, you know, in terms of cruelty for the animals concerned, but also devastating in terms of any realistic scientific evidence we can get that this is actually working. You know, that. The whole issue of controlled shooting, which Chris is absolutely right, you know, while just is coming back on this, you know, it was a method that was dreamt up really by Jim Pace, the shadow agriculture minister in David Cameron's time to just find a cheaper solution to killing badgers. It was never going to be a simple thing to do. These are low squat muscular animals, nocturnal. It was going to be difficult to kill them cleanly with one shot. Everyone who shot animals for a living knew this, but the government went ahead with it anyway. They put an independent expert panel in for the first year and it came up with recommendations for making serious changes to the policy because they found that many badgers took up to five minutes to die, blood loss, organ failure, dragged themselves off and died. And as Rosie quite rightly has said recently, we might not even know how many badgers are dying because many of them might never be found. Yet this policy has continued to be expanded. You know, over 60% of the badgers killed last year were by controlled shooting. I've no doubt that it will be a significant percentage of the badgers killed this year as well. 
and we've not tested badgers for disease. And I know that discussion went on in the early stages between Peter Kendall, the NFU president at the time, and Owen Patterson, the Secretary of State, and they made a political decision. And there were people in the NFU that I knew had worked with that wanted to see that data to show that within the trial period that you could prove that badgers did have a significant level of disease and it was worth killing them, justified expanding the policy. But we didn't, the politicians and the leader of the NFU didn't want that evidence. I don't think they had any confidence that it would be sufficient in terms of the level of disease in the animals to justify the expansion. And weren't they right? Because at the end of the day, only about 900 plus badgers were ever tested in the, in the numbers killed so far. I think it's 2016, 17, under great pressure, the government did test badgers from a number of cold zones. Then it took over a year to release the data. And again, we only found around 5% of those animals had a disease state where they might potentially infect other badgers, never mind a discussion about cattle. So we have a very cruel method of killing the animals. We have huge increasing costs to the public taxpayer, much of which is hidden as well. You know, we don't get all the legal defense costs. We see the policing costs, which are significant. We don't get all the Whitehall administration costs. So, you know, we are estimating 60, 70 million pounds. It could be higher, but remember this was sold to the public as being a farmer led cheap way to deal with this policy compared to the use of civil servants in the past. And what really worries me today is that I think it's a policy out of control. I think it's a policy that largely has no public scrutiny or political oversight. I think it's now largely been left in the hands of the chief scientist at DEFRA, Christine Middlemass, who, you know, when she spoke on Radio 4 recently alongside me, sounded far from confident in defending it. And I, I, I've seen her Q&A in Farmers Weekly today that the Times contacted me on this morning, where she's now saying that she thinks badger culling should maybe go on until the end of this decade. So we could be looking to 2030, not just 2025 anymore. So that's another significant shift in the goalposts. And we have every right, I think, to be angry and feel betrayed by the government. At the end of the day, they did come out in March with recommendations based upon the Godfrey review that gave a clear indication that we're looking for an exit strategy from culling and that badger vaccination and cattle vaccination was the way that we were gonna go forward. But by May, as, as Rosie quite rightly said, that issued seven new supplementary coal licenses, all for culling, nothing on vaccination. And in September, we got 11 new coal licenses. Actually, we have 12 because it's an adjacent area of culling going on in Nottinghamshire that hasn't even been published as a new license, but it's happening anyway, because we've got that under FOI, so we know it's happening. We've got evidence that you know, coal contractors are putting out snares in the coal zones, but no one is checking as to whether they're trapping animals in this way and killing them. We just don't know. The level of monitoring is almost non-existent. So how do we know this is safe in terms of public safety or in terms of animal welfare? You will get images tomorrow in the press. They'll go out at 10 o'clock tonight of what are horrendous scenes coming out of Derbyshire. Badgers being powered in the back of vans and thrown into barrels. Uh, this is the reality of what's going on in that county now. And that's why, you know, I went to see Carrie Simmons, who I knew well and spoke to her in Downing Street last year and said, listen, despite all of what we're doing on this policy, all of what we're trying to say, no one is listening. You must speak to Boris Johnson. You must get this to him. And she did, to be fair to her. She got everything I provided to her to him. And I said, you must get him to intervene because I want to know if this is really science led. And I know what happens as a civil servant when a prime minister intervenes on a policy, the civil service goes into meltdown and ministers go crazy because they don't want prime ministers interfering in things that they think is none of their business. And it was interesting to see that when Johnson did intervene on the Derbyshire Cull decision, it caused chaos in DEFRA. It obviously led to a significant rethink and a reevaluation of certain aspects of the policy and led to that license being withheld last year alongside all the great campaigning that Derbyshire Wildlife Trust and Badger Trust and other groups were doing as well. But it showed that it was a political intervention in the judgment of the NFU judicial review back in May, the judge accepted it was politically that you could come in and intervene and stop it. And I think that's you know, what really makes me think about this policy. It's not science led. And just to finish, I do believe we have to work with farms. I believe in the National Nature Service. It's been promoted. It's something working on the board of link that I do that I feel strongly that we need to get millions of young people back into nature working in the countryside. And wouldn't it be wonderful to get them working on badger vaccination? I believe in the big society. I thought it was a good idea that David Cameron and Steve Hilton, his advisor, came up with in 2010 and 11. I think we can help deal with problems of things like this without just government intervention. And I believe that there is a huge amount of support for vaccinating badgers and working with farmers. And what we have found is that when we get to work with farmers, as we've heard earlier on, we build bridges, we build respect, we build trust, we take away all of this anger that we've seen as a result of this policy over the last seven years. And I think that trust and that belief that we can work together and find a solution 
that is more humane, that brings farmers and conservationists together is so important. Communicate the value of this badge of vaccination projects, get on with cattle vaccines, get on with the cattle based measures, better for taxpayers, better for badgers, of course, but also ultimately, in my view, better for farmers as well. So Dominic, thank you for that. Briefly, though, just tell me briefly, do you feel helpless right now? I mean, we've had a lot of comments in tonight, not least, say, Jan Smith saying she said she signed every petition going and written to her MP, but she feels helpless on this issue now. How do you feel about it? I feel we're progressing it. I think it's a much wider issue. You know, Chris was on the panel that I chaired at uh, Bird Fair this year, um, and we had Ian Boyd, the former DEFRA chief scientist on that panel, who was very much to a degree an architect of the policy, and he stood down as chief scientist last year. Now, I asked him, I said, if you were still chief scientist, would you have signed this expansion off? Now, he said that he still backed the idea of badger culling having a role to play in lowering bovine TB in cattle. But it was interesting that he moved the discussion quickly onto the cattle industry. He said, we have far too many cattle on the land in this country. And if we're going to deal with the climate emergency, what you know is, is priority, reduce methane, reduce carbon emissions, move to this plant-based economy, which is really what we need to do, not just in this country, around the world. We've got to change that. We've got to reduce the size of it, the scale of it. And if we did that, you wouldn't have such a problem with this disease control issue. This is really about intensive cattle systems, keeping cattle inside for six months, moving large numbers from around the country. So we have to change that. And I think to be quite fair to farmers, unless they can change, and unless we can support that change, that's politicians and the public, many of them won't be in business in five years. Even through COVID they're struggling because so many cafes and outlets for milk have now shut down as a result of that. So we need to help them through change. And I think Ian was right in what he said. And I think this indeed would make a key driver to actually reducing the threat of this disease as well. Okay, great. Dominic, thank you very much. Could I, so, sorry, could I just make a point? Sorry. Yeah, do. Um, Go on, Rosie. I was, because I talked earlier about the avoiding polarisation, and I think it's really important that we avoid polarisation, not just between uh, people who are in favour of the car or against the car, pro-vaccination, anti-vaccination, but also we avoid political polarisation. We don't want this to be something which goes with right wing, left wing, whatever, that if you're one, one, one kind of political persuasion, uh, you know, you're pro-colour and if you have other kind. Um, I think it's really important, having having been, as, as Dominic mentioned, a, a government advisor at the time when um, uh, I was a government advisor for 10 years, um, it's important to know that the current policy was Labour Party policy. Um, now, it isn't Labour Party policy anymore, but it was when they were in power. Um, and when we wrote um, that badger culling can make no meaningful contribution to the control of cattle TB, indeed, some policies under consideration might make things worse. That was us talking about the current policy because it was at the time this policy of licensing farmers to, to do the culling themselves, we were afraid could potentially make cattle TB worse. And I think that's important to bear in mind that this is, is often, often uh, portrayed um, as, as being aligned with particular political parties and it really isn't. I mean, at the time when I was a government advisor, it was across the board, everybody, all the politicians were pro cull and it's changed since. But uh, I think it's just important to make make it clear that this isn't particularly aligned with any particular political persuasion. And, and I think you're absolutely right, Rosie. And to be fair, I think at that point, it's worth also stating that, you know, the problem with the, the massive increase in bovine TB and cattle as a result of the restocking after foot and mouth in 2000, 2001, without proper tests, was a Labour-led policy decision under Nick Brown as Agriculture Minister you know, working with the food and NFU at the time, the food industry I was working in. So that was a colossal mistake in my view in terms of control. And you can definitely put the blame of that at the Labour Party. So yes, there's enough blame to go around on all politicians you're absolutely right about. I think that's very interesting, Rosie, what you were saying there. And if if the situation was that a few years ago, actually, as you, as you summarise it, pretty much all politicians were pro coal, but now we've got quite a lot of politicians that are anti coal. You could say we're making some progress, even if it doesn't feel like it at this precise moment. Anyway, Dominic, thank you very much for that. And also, Rosie, for that really important comment. So let's now go to Joe Smith, who's chief executive of the Derbyshire Wildlife Trust. Derbyshire is, of course, one of those counties that's one of those fringe areas to the cull. And Derbyshire Wildlife Trust has been doing some amazing work on this issue, particularly around vaccination and really frustrated, I think, with some of the recent developments. Joe. Thanks, Craig, um, and hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here to discuss an issue that's really close to our hearts in Derbyshire. I think unlike Cornwall, Derbyshire sits in what we call the edge area. And the edge area sits between the high risk zone, which is the southwest, and the low risk zone, which is up in the northeast. 
And the whole point of the edge area was to provide a buffer to stop the spread of the disease from the really high risk areas out into the low risk areas. And much as Cheryl was talking about earlier, we recognized really early on that although we didn't feel it was a badger issue, it was building as a badger issue. The farmers were talking about badgers all of the time. And we really wanted to provide a pragmatic solution to those farmers, because as everyone's talked about, TB is a terrible, terrible problem. We have cattle ourselves. As a wildlife tourist, we have Highland cattle. And you know the stress of TB tests and the kind of process of TB tests is really horrible. So we wanted to provide a solution. So we started our vaccination programme back in 2014. And we've vaccinated every year since then. So we've just completed our seventh season of vaccination. And we even managed to vaccinate in 2015 when those of you that are in this loop will remember there was a, a real shortage of vaccine. And we actually had to source our own vaccine from Canada and deal with a whole bunch of paperwork to do with that. So we're really proud of what we've achieved. And we've been working with landowners throughout that seven year period. So we've talked a lot about working with farmers rather than against farmers. And we've got about 60 farmers now that we work with, that we have been working with for a number of years. And we've vaccinated nearly a thousand badgers. And we've done um, 200 just this year alone. And our programme is completely and wholly dependent on volunteers. So we have one paid member of staff, Debbie Bailey. Some of you may know her. I know Rosie definitely does. Um, she's an amazing, inspiring person. She used to be a nurse. She started as a volunteer. She now leads our programme. And we have 100 volunteers who get up at four o'clock in the morning, and go out and put peanuts in traps, help us with the programme. We run the programme between May and October in terms of vaccination and then all through the winter we work with landowners and farmers to support them and help them and try and encourage them into the program. And not only that, we actually host the National Vaccination Training Program for DEFRA, so we train all the vaccinators across the country and furthermore we've supported several other wildlife trusts and other badger trusts to run their own vaccination programmes as well and we'll hear a little bit from Avon's Wildlife Trust um, project soon, and we supported them to set up their programme. And so, you know, we've built up this trust, we've built up this understanding, we're improving the communication, we're working with farmers. We were really proud of what we've achieved. We were really excited about the fact that it was really expanding and it was getting bigger and stronger all of the time. So we were absolutely devastated last summer to hear that there was a threat of a cull in Derbyshire in this edge area that's supposed to be the buffer where vaccination is the solution and culling was not supposed to happen. Um, and so, you know, Dominic's talked a little bit about um, what happened last year. We ran a, a big campaign. We weren't the only ones that ran campaigns, but we ran a big campaign. We got a lot of supporters um, to write to their MPs. We got a lot of MPs to come out and visit our vaccination programme and talk to the farmers that were involved. They lobbied Boris, as we know, Boris made a U-turn. I won't make any comment about Boris and U-turns, but he did make a U-turn and he um, agreed to prioritise vaccination in Derbyshire to enable that programme to establish and grow. And as Dominic said, there was a judicial review of that decision by the NFU and we were part of that process. So we joined in as a, a sort of intervened in that process and we learned a lot about the fact that at that point, the government were determined to prioritise vaccination. So we carried on with our vaccination programme. We got new landowners. The trust continued to build. Um, and so we were delighted in the spring when um, the government response to the Godfrey Review was to um, A, concentrate on cattle, because it's a cattle problem and the solution lies with cattle, and B, to move from what they call um, lethal to non-lethal control, i.e. from culling to vaccination. So it was doubly devastating that um, we faced another threat of a cull this summer again, and absolutely devastating for the hundreds of um, volunteers, but also all the people that have supported us. Our, our programme, um, we do get some money from the government, but a lot of our programme is um, funded by ourselves and by our supporters. So we've got hundreds of supporters and members who have contributed resources to this project and yet now we do have a cull 
in Derbyshire. So there is going to be a call. They're calling, as Rosie says, as we speak in Derbyshire, where vaccination is the answer and where we've spent seven years building up that programme. There are buffer zones around the call zones, but they're nowhere near big enough. So we know that there will be calls close to where we've been vaccinating badges. And um, we're not supposed to know that because the call zones are actually confidential, but they were released accidentally by two of the MPs. So we do know where they are and we know they're quite close. So we know that probably badgers who've been vaccinated are likely to be called, which is a very big waste of public funding and a very big waste of all the resources that have been put in by DEFRA and ourselves into building a vaccination programme. And I think, you know, that, that, that's something that we're continuing to fight about. We're, we're um, seeking legal advice as we speak about where we stand around that. Um, but I think I wanted to finish by just saying um, that, you know, Rosie mentioned earlier about COVID. And I think, you know, because of COVID, we all know a lot more about disease than perhaps we ever wanted to. Um, and I think if you think about COVID, we know that the only way to eradicate disease is to have a vaccine. And so I strongly believe that the government should be putting more money, resources and effort into a cattle vaccine. We also know because of COVID that there are ways of reducing transmission. We know that for COVID it's people not mingling quite so much and sanitation, washing your hands. And it's exactly the same for cattle. You know, we need to stop the cattle movement being quite so high and we need to improve the sanitation on farms. Some farms are brilliant. I'm not saying that they're all bad, but I am saying there's a lot of improvements that could be made. And they are the things that will prevent this disease from taking hold in areas where it hasn't done yet. And I thought I'd just end with a little fact because everyone loves a fact. So I looked up um, cattle movements just out of interest really. And last year there were four and a half million cattle movements in Great Britain. And let me just check, 14 and a half thousand of those were from the high risk area to the low risk area. So I just want to end by saying this is a cattle problem. It's a devastating cattle problem, but it's a cattle problem and the solution lies in cattle. However, if badgers are a little part of the problem and they are a little part of the problem, as Rosie highlighted earlier, there is absolutely no justification to kill them, especially in the edge area. And we should be prioritizing and growing and funding a decent strategic level vaccination program. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Okay, so just a few couple of things to clarify there, Joe, because we've had a lot of questions around some of the things you were talking about there. Just to be really clear, you've received money from the government, from Notary, to help vaccinate, vaccinate badges, and there's nothing to now stop those same badges being cold. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So we've received about £130,000 from the government, from DEFRA, as part of their Badger Edge vaccination scheme. So there's been a BEVS 1 and a BEVS 2, so Badger Eggs, uh, Edge Vaccination Scheme, BEVS. Um, we've received funding in both of those schemes, um, and that, that funding is, is then going to probably lead to those badgers who we've been vaccinating. You have to vaccinate them for five years in a row for it to be effective. We've got to seven years, so we're starting to get to that point, and actually um, they are likely to be called if the call continues and grows as we expect. Okay, thank you, Joe. Can, well, so you're can I ask a question again? I'm very sorry. On, Rosie. Sorry to cut in. Um, Joe, can I just ask? So, because you you mentioned you'd got sort of sixty farmers you've been working with. Um, so, have there been farmers that you were vaccinating who have switched to culling? And if so, what have they told you about their reasons? We haven't had any that have actually switched, but we have had several farmers who have um, said like committed to the program and then now dropped out. So they're kind of future farmers that would have grown into the programme. Um, and they basically said that um, whilst culling is available to them, they would like to cull. And even if we've talked to them about, you know, the, the, the science and the evidence and the reasons why vaccination is the better solution for them. Some people agree, not everyone does. I was just interested in the overlap between exactly where the culling and the vaccination is happening. I mean, the part of the problem is that they're, and part of our concern really is that their call zones are, as you know, redacted. So nobody yeah, knows. We, yeah. are, but vaccination buffer zones are actually in the public domain. So, um, so we, everybody will know where the buffer zones are, but nobody knows where the call zones are. So we cannot be sure what will happen. 
Um, but you know, Derbyshire is not a huge county, and and we've been vaccinating in several different places across the county. So, there's a Joe, we've had some we've had some questions on that. We had a question from Pat Lywood who said, "How do I find out find out if there's a cult in my area?" You're saying there's no way of finding out, essentially. Well, I mean, it, what, there, were, there was some leaks, so if you do a bit yeah. of research, you might be able to find it. But officially, that information is secretive, and I, I guess the reason for that is because um, you know there have there have been some um, you know the policing and the, and, and the issues around that being safe um, and that yeah. why so yeah you cannot find out where the calls are even if I mean I should add as, a, as someone who holds a research license um, I can't I, I'm not aware of where culling happens even if my natural England research licensed you know collared badges were were going to be killed they wouldn't tell me and I think it's just it's for security reasons and I think it's just a blanket thing it's not it's not personal it's just they have a rule that they don't tell anyone Right. So look, thank you very much. Before we get into the wider chat, we just wanted to show you a bit more video of a Badger vaccination program in process. Uh, this is a video uh, that uh, Joe was saying earlier about how Derbyshire Wildlife Trust has been working with Avon Wildlife Trust to really get Badger vaccination going in uh, the West Country. Like any species in our landscape, badgers are a really important building block. They perform really crucial functions within an ecosystem. Bovine tuberculosis is a huge issue for livestock farmers. The government's response has been to roll out a cull of badgers, but vaccination is a really good way of helping the farmers with the problem they have and also protecting wildlife. We're running this vaccination project on one of our nature reserves. The Somerset Badger Group, who are our partners in the project, mapped out the whole site to basically find out where the badgers are moving through the landscape. We set the traps as close to dusk as possible. Then you come out at sunrise. They first check over the badger for any illness. They vaccinate them and they clip a few of the outer hairs off and spray the badger with stock paint to ensure that they're not repeating the vaccination on the same individual the next day. There's then a big cleanup operation that happens. Badgers are already iconic species. We are trying to offer a solution that doesn't involve culling them. Great, so we've had so many questions and comments coming in from the hundreds and hundreds of you online tonight watching this live. And I'm gonna try and get through as many as possible. There are a whole series of questions here, which I'm gonna throw first to Rosie, but then let everyone else on the panel join in. Because you've been fascinated about the contrast between TV, TB, and COVID and actually the government's response to COVID and government's response to bovine TB very, being very different. There's a question from Donald Griffin asking whether the uh, issues around density of cattle, that the high density of cattle that we have now in uh, modern livestock systems, does that lead to greater transmission of bovine TB? TB. Uh, the question from Jan Smith saying, is TB spread by putting slurry on the fields? And another question from Lorraine Wilkinson saying, I've read Scotland is TB free. If this is the case, how can they have achieved this if England can't? Is it politics again? Rosie, kick us off and then everyone else. All go. right. I'll try. So first off, cattle density. Um, when people compare uh, herds which are affected by TB and herds which are not the one thing which always comes out is cattle herd size. Um, the industry has changed over the years that we have fewer cattle herds, each of which is larger on average. Um, and so there's no, not so much density, but, but the number of animals that you're managing in a, in a unit, that's definitely a risk factor. Um, Incidentally, let me just, although it wasn't a question of badger density, it uh, actually is, is the other way. So, so um, a larger, a higher badger density, larger groups actually have a lower proportion of, uh, of badgers with TB in them. Um, slurry, slurry is really interesting. And actually one of the things that we've been doing recently, we, you know, we put lots of collars on badgers to see what they do and cattle to see what they do. We also put trackers on, uh, on muck spreaders to see where they went. Um, and that's been very interesting. We, we suspect that uh, slurry could be an important cause of, uh, of TB transmission through the environment. Uh, and certainly it's been interesting to see how, just how far uh, and where slurry goes. Um, there's not a great deal of control over the distribution of slurry through the, far, through, uh, through the farmland. And uh, that's um, certainly an area of research for us at the moment. Um, the status of Scotland, uh, I was a bit annoyed when I hear people say, oh, you know, Scotland managed to get TB free without killing a single badger. Scotland has never had such a problem with TB as, um, as England and Wales and Ireland have. Um, and why is that? Well, I think it's, um, 
so if you go back to the 1950s, 40% of cattle herds uh, in the whole country were, were infected with TB. Uh, and then there was this massive effort to, to control it through, through test and slaughter of cattle. And it was only really in the far west of Cornwall, where I am now, and in the uh, Cotswold Escarpment in Gloucestershire, where there were significant numbers of, uh, of herds continuing to have TB, even despite all of this, these cattle-based measures. Uh, and that's where it turned out the badgers were, were involved. And it's spread since then uh, back out from those areas. Um, and so it's probably that like, like the eastern parts of the country, the northern parts of, of England were, it was, it was cleared out by cattle testing. It just never got happened to never get into the badger population. Um, and, um, and so that's why it is. It's, it's, uh, it's the same reason as there's sort of, you know, no TB in East Anglia really. Uh, it just never, it never got in. To the but nonetheless, um, so maybe it's a question to you, to Dominic, to pick up and run with. Is the politics of this different in England, Wales, Scotland? Well, you know, in, in Wales, we have a test, vaccinate, remove policy that's in place, which we do have some differences with because we've been in correspondence with the Welsh First Minister on that recently as well. It's clearly aimed at farms where you've got persistent outbreaks of TB. And the idea is you test badgers, you know, that are trapped. And, and if they do have TB, you remove them by lethal injection. Uh, if they don't, then you, you actually vaccinate and release them. So that sounds quite a, a good way forward. The trouble is, as Rosie knows, the tests are not that accurate. So we found that quite a lot of the badgers that are actually killed, when they post-mortem them, they actually find they don't have TB. So we have some ethical concerns about that. And we also think it's extremely costly. So they've been spending, you know, millions and millions on, on, a, on a, a very small number of badgers, just over 100, 150 badgers, not exactly a number, but you could spend, you could achieve far more on, on, on a, a vaccination program like Joe and Rosie are working on um, if you go back to trapping and vaccinating using BCG methods so you know that's it um, it's also worth saying that you know I, I mentioned it earlier on that the foot and mouth situation is what fed the significant growth in the disease I think there was 4,800 uh, TB reactors in the herd in around 2000 and then you had the outbreak of foot and mouth that many of us will remember and you know it led to a significant destruction of the national herd and then you had to restock and there was a decision taken i mean jim scudamore the chief vet at the time said to tony blair and nick brown the agriculture minister that you have a choice and you can move cattle and get them back on fields again in the midlands and in the northwest and other parts of the country but most of them will come up from the southwest where you didn't have significant levels of foot and mouth but as rosie quite rightly said you had a persistent problem of bovine tb but you'll have to test them and you also said that we need to shut down a lot of the cattle markets because these are key transmission routes for the spread of the disease but i'm afraid the nfu and the food industry being lobbied by them basically decided that's not what they wanted and they, they influenced the government to basically move large numbers of cattle with no controls and we saw by 2002 2003 the numbers of tb reactors have gone up over 28,000. it was an explosion in the disease and to be quite fair it's never really come down and remember bovine tb is a form of industrial pollution it pours out of cattle effectively and it goes into badgers it goes into rats stoats weasels foxes domestic animals dogs cats you name it we're not monitoring a lot of the spread in those other animals the focus is primarily on the badger but it is a form of industrial pollution. I use that word um, just to explain what I think is the problem. And, and as some of the people calling in tonight uh, are quite rightly registered, this is about the intensity of that cattle industry and the numbers of cattle you move, which is what Ian Boyd was saying, to be fair, when his view is that we need to reduce that size down, that would reduce the disease risk as well. All right, good. Uh, Cheryl, we've had a lot of people very impressed with the work that Cornwall Wildlife Trust has been doing on this issue and asking you to, to try and do that in many other parts of the country, not least East Cornwall as well. Uh, you know, what do you think the potential is for expanding that approach? Um, in future, we Oh, well, Cheryl's breaking up a bit. Chris, um, I'll come to Chris and see if we can just improve the connection with uh, Cheryl. Uh, yeah, I think we're the best to do that. Chris, you'll be... We've got existing All right. All right. OK. Uh, well, so, Chris, you will obviously have a lot of interactions with the members of the public over this, people that will know you very well from your broadcasts and so on. 
what's the kind of you were talking before about how this is very polarized but equally you know this pours out real emotions and and, and real expression of the love that people in this country have for badgers you know why is it you think that this issue sort of captures the imagination so much and how people just get so connected with this and you know what is it about badgers that particularly people love i think there's a cultural connection to our fairy tales and children's stories so on and so forth i think the badger is seen as a relatively benign animal although <laughs> rosie and i through our studies over the years <laughs> know that that's not always the case it is our largest terrestrial predatory animal it's an omnivore but a carnivore uh, as as well um but I, I, I think as well, you know, it's, it seems as a, you know, that there's a degree of secrecy. It's not eternal. People are drawn to it. A lot of people say to me, you know, I've never seen a live badger. I only ever see them dead on the roadside. So there's a certain allure to it. It's beyond many people's reach. Um, it's therefore an animal that captivates their, their, their attention. I think the cull is seen as a, as a, a you know, a blunt trauma blow. It's, it's bludgeoning a, a species. I think that, you know, Dominic's work and many others have pointed out that, the, you know, uh, that it's failed to adhere to scientific advice and that there's a collective sense of injustice. And when we hear stories about about the, the one in Derbyshire where, you know, government support has gone into vaccination and yet the self same government then sanctions a cull, which will in, in, in fact end up culling the animals which they've been in, investing in, basically investing public money in, uh, that in sense of injustice grows. I, I think there is, you know, we, we, we're talking about farmers here, but we do have a problem with the farming groups. The NFU has been very aggressive in its pro-cull policy. The NFU doesn't have a great history of wanting or seeming to want to listen to conservation initiatives and listen to the science around issues like that. Which is why, again, I think that we should be trying to, to reach out to them, but then they're, they're not easy to reach out to, not just on badger culling, but on things, issues such as glyphosate and other aspects of our farmland management. Um, and I think all of this is frustrating people. And you've got to remember this is coming at a time where we see reports saying that since 1970, we lost 68% of the world's biodiversity. We know that we've lost 90 million birds from the UK countryside. We know that we've lost all of those insects from the studies in Germany and France, and also now in the UK. I think a growing number of people are better educated when it comes to the, the parlous state of our countryside. People like myself, people like yourself, people like so many of the people watching this will know that on our watch as proactive conservationists, we We've lost a lot of this and we've lost it because we've been at times a little bit too timid. We haven't been campaigning as hard enough and as forthrightly enough as we should uh, have done. And uh, some of us are trying to, you know, make up for lost time. But we have to do that with the grace and the care uh, and the care and the cleverness that Cheryl's told us about. You know, there's no point in opposing blunt force trauma with more blunt force trauma to, mm -hmm. as my mum would so simplistically say, two wrongs don't make a right. And if yeah. we have right on our side, if we go back to right persecution, where well, we know we're right, it's an illegal act, it's a crime in the UK then we should, we should be able to take the ball by the horns and win those arguments in a peaceful, democratic way. Um, it's frustrating, of course, when, when, when things like the, you know, the cull goes ahead in, in Derbyshire. But we've got to keep our heads. And we've got to realise, as I keep saying to people, that winning is not giving up. We've got to keep applying, you know, our correct methodology. We've got to keep reaching out. We've got to keep being reasonable. We've got to keep listening to the scientists. We've got to keep investing in those scientists. Um, and, and, and that's going to be the way that we are going to need to move forward. And that's not saying that we don't take a very positive, as I've said before, and proactive stance against our politicians of whatever party they are, because they should be listening to the scientists and they should be listening to us. But again, so we're going to be bold and firm and say what we believe, uh, yeah. not pull any punches, but equally, we've got to try and be working out building bridges at the same time. It, it, it's think... actually a classic campaigning technique. It's not easy, but it's a classic campaigning technique. Do you yeah. think, sorry, do you, do you think that there's a there's actually a suffering for you were talking about the connection that people that some people feel to badges? I, I sometimes wonder whether that's actually problematic, because I think there's this idea that you know, just like when you're a kid, you or you think that um, in order to, to to work, medicine has to taste nasty. And I think there's this idea that uh, a disease control method is only going to work if it's tough. So if it's vaccination, if it's sort of kind to the badgers, 
by definition, it can't work because you've got to you know, come down hard on it and, 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 and be a big, strong, tough man and deal with it like a, you know, like a, like a strong person. And I sometimes feel that um, there's actually some of the kind of innate uh, objection that some people have to badger vaccination is because, because it seems kind, it, 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 it can't work. I don't know if anyone else has... Um, but it, it, there is an ethical it. issue. You're absolutely right. But I think there's a very ethical issue at the heart of this debate. I've, I've got a comment here from Virginia McKenna that all of you will know, who's you know, the founder of Born Free, that couldn't get a message in. So I'll just, I'll, she says, could we just talk and focus about the feeling, the pain and the hunger of, of badgers that are killed? Because you know, and, and that is a crucial issue. This is almost medieval in the way this policy is being undertaken. You know. As we talk, there are badgers being thrown into the back of vans and blasted with shotguns, and it's it's horrible. And we should come to a point in our history of civilization, that's the word to use, that we shouldn't have to do this to any wild animal. Uh, we should be able to find a better way. And, you know, the British Veterinary Association position, you know, I've had a, a discussion last week with James Russell on a podcast that will go out next week, that the president of BVA, and we discussed this at length, and I said that, in 2015, the British Veterinary Association came to a conclusion that the control shooting of badgers was not only cruel, it was ineffective and they couldn't support it. And I said to James, fine, why did you continue to allow that policy to be expanded? Why didn't you go to the government and say, we're not going to support this policy if you continue to use that killing method? Because if, if they'd have pulled the plug on it then, you'd have been left with just trapping and shooting badgers. And as Joe from the Derbyshire Wildlife Trust and others know, that you can then do a cost comparison. Why would you be shooting a badger with a shotgun in the morning when you've trapped it, when you can actually BCG vaccinate it and release it? That's really what we should be talking about here. But on so, that, but and on I think that, that's a crucial element. It is a crucial element. On that, we've got Cheryl back, I'm pleased to say. Uh, Cheryl, I, I'd asked you before, the, the, uh, what about the potential to expand the effort that you were doing in Cornwall to other bits of Cornwall and other bits of the country. I mean, it's taken a lot of effort from you and the Cornwall Wildlife Trust to do that. We're here ready to help and work al alongside farmers. I mean, the ones we're working with are, are paying in, as I said. Um, there's coal licenses that have to run. So but it doesn't mean we can't do anything now. And that's why we're taking this approach of raising awareness and making sure we're not just talking about badges, but we're talking about cattle. And so that the farmers aren't getting the information on, on vaccination. That's what we found when we went to talk to that group. They're, I think they're being let down because they're not hearing both sides. And, and I wasn't there persuading them that vaccination was the right thing. It's give them the information, they'll weigh up the pros and cons. And that's why we, you know, we were so surprised when those, so many in that group decided to go with vaccination, but they were there in the right frame of mind to listen and they could see the sense in it. So if, if it ultimately could be better for farmers and, and the public support it, and as we've said earlier, British farmers need British, the British public support now more than ever with Brexit. So why keep putting a wedge between I really don't understand the, the stance of the groups that are meant to be representing farmers. There's a, one of the farmers that, um, that we're working with didn't feel very well represented by the, the big farming group, so he withdrew and he put his money into vaccination instead. All right. Well, look, I'm, I can't believe it, but we're really running out of time. We're just in the last few minutes of this wild life. So I'm going to come to each of the panellists now and just answer me two things. And I'll start with Cheryl, uh, if I can, please. Uh, what would the, what's the thing you'd most like to see happen most urgently now to try and uh, improve this situation? And also, kind of, what is your what's your favourite fact about badgers to try and put a smile on our face before the evening's over? I think I'd like to see people being less judgmental, the farmers. Um, I can't under, I can't begin to understand what they go through I don't even have a pet but I've seen farmers welling up when they're telling me about their cattle being shot we've got to be less ju judgmental and more generous and try and work with them I'm glad I went first for my uh, my favorite thing about badgers since others might have this one as well um, but it was the stripy face and why have they got a stripy face and that's because um, in fact I wrote this down because it was in BBC Wildlife magazine and um, it's the guy says, in a nutshell, a badger's markings worn other carnivores, historically mainly wolves, so that stripy face is for the wolves' benefit. But unlike other fluffy animals living at the edge of the wood, this one bites back. 
Excellent. I can't believe that's the first time I've heard the word fluffy tonight. Um, <laughs> so let's go to Rosie, please. Rosie, what would you most like to see happen most urgently now? Uh, I'd, on this I'd like and to what's see your this... favourite fact? About oh, this? my goodness. Well, so I'd like I'd like to see this mainstreamed among farmers. I think um, it's exciting to we have we have farmers on that. Uh, so I work with Cheryl on that project and you know, there are farmers taking part. I'd like to see farmers doing the vaccination. Mm. Um, and I think when farmers when it's farmers leading other farmers, that's when it's going to take off. Um, when, when we, you know, the wildlife people are just helping with a bit of training and we can go back to doing research. Um, favorite fact about badgers my kids love that they have that they talk to each other with poo um but i have to say my my favorite fact is that um uh is actually that they can be so cubs can be conceived anytime between february and october but then they're all born at the same time the following february they have um, wow. it's incredibly variable um delayed implantation and i did my PhD on that okay thanks and chris what about you what's the Number one thing in a summary that you would like to see next and your favourite fact about badgers. I, I'd like to see the NFU open the door to conservationists. I'd like to see a conference where Rosie could take to the stage and Cheryl could talk you know, about her project and they would welcome conservationists to come in and, and spread the word to their farmers. Uh, not just about the badger issue, but all about other issues that we have. And in return, I would like to see a serious pledge from conservationists and the, the broader public in the UK to support British farming through what is going to be a really tough time. Yeah. And, that, and, and, I, and I mean that by, you know, using the pound in, in our pocket. And my favourite fact about badgers is that my dogs love to roll in their poo because they're not is the badgers don't just talk to themselves with their poo but my dogs talk to other animals with their poo there's lots of theories as to why our pets like to roll in particularly pungent poo like badgers i quite don't mind the smell of badger poo i've got so i don't like it all over my furniture so they do get washed off but they there's a number of theories and, and one is that they dress themselves up as a form of camouflage so the dogs if you like are, are dressing themselves in the smell of a badger so that they don't smell like a dog because many larger carnivores will kill smaller carnivores. And so my poodles out in the woods think if they roll in badger poo, the big bad wolf might not attack them at night time. Fantastic. Chris, thank you very much. My dog rolls in badger poo as well, absolutely loves the stuff. So um, uh, thanks so much for that. So Dominic, let's come to you. What would you most like to see next and uh, in a sentence and then your favorite fact about badgers? I'd see a national badger vaccination strategy, which would put public money into training badger vaccinators, more equipment. And I'd like to see it linked to the na National Nature Service project where we get, you know, effectively millions of young people into the countryside, you know, helping across a wide range of conservation projects and making badger vaccination a key element of that. I think that would be good in terms of unemployment, great for getting people job opportunities to understand about farming conservation and bring these sides together. So we should get on and make that happen. And my interesting fact about badgers is that Donald Trump is obsessed by badgers. Oh. Uh, there was a book written a few months ago that um, he would often you know, interrupt national security briefings to ask about badgers, their behavior, ecology, he's actually quite scared of them. But you know he's actually quite obsessed by them. So there you go. So wow. if he's worried by badgers, I'm on the badgers' side. That's all I can say. <laughs> That's very interesting. I wonder if the Democrats know that. Um, I did think yeah, learn possibly. new facts. I thought I'd really learn go. new facts about badgers tonight, not necessarily about Donald Trump. Um, Google badgers and Donald Trump. You'll find lots of interesting things. There you go. Joe, <laughs> I'll let you close us out, Joe. So Joe, what was the what would you most like to see happen next? And what's your favourite fact about badgers? Okay, great. So I think I'm going to slightly cheat and have two um, asks. So they're both of government. One is, please invest in a cattle vaccine and speed that up. And secondly, uh, we need a strategic approach. So it's linked to Dominic's really, but a strategic approach to vaccination rather than the ad hoc approach that they're supporting at the moment. Um, and, and it seems like we've all been talking about badger poo. So I think my favourite um, badger poo fact, given that we've narrowed it down now, is um, that they don't poo in their sets. They have lovely little toilets called latrines that they communally use just outside their set. So they're very civilised, lovely animals. Brilliant, Joe. Thank you so much. And listen, thank you to all the panellists tonight. I really, really appreciate it. To Rosie, to Cheryl, to Chris to Dominic and to Joe. And thank you to all the team behind the scenes making this work. And thank you for all of you, hundreds and hundreds of you tonight, the, the most we've ever had on a wildlife so far. 
joining tonight. And it, each time we do these wild lives, we have thousands and thousands of people watching it on YouTube afterwards. So thank you so much for watching either live, for your comments and questions coming in. Uh, we, we do look at them all, even if we can't read them all out. So it's really, really useful. And uh, thanks to all of you that watch it after time as well at the weekend or whatever. So thank you so much. At the Wildlife Trust, we're very clear. We're opposed to culling. That should be uh, very clear. And we're very pro-vaccination, but we're not just pro-vaccination. We're working really hard to make vaccination work. And as you've heard, working with farmers to try and make sure it's a solution that works for them. And that's because we really believe that we need badgers out there in the ecosystem performing the role that they do. They're wonderful creatures. They're on our logo as well. And we're going to campaign vigorously to end this cull but also to build those bridges with farmers to try and depolarize this debate and to make a real difference so that we can move on from this crazy time and actually move to a point where we're restoring uh, British ecosystems the way they should be. And we can actually have a future where nature is flourishing alongside good sustainable farming. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great evening. Thank you.